Thank you for, for coming, taking time out of your, your busy days. I know uh, this, your time is valuable. What I'm hoping to be able to do in the next 30 minutes is three things. Uh, one, I want to give you a, a context so that you can understand AI. Uh, you're going to encounter it in your business, with your vendors, with your internal uh, people. And you know, it's always helpful, as an engineer I've learned, it's always helpful to know how generally something works because it leads you to ask the right questions afterwards. Um, so I'll give you a framework to do that with, with AI that, that, that's worked for me over the years. I'll follow that up with uh, talking about the biggest problem our industry is facing right now. And spoiler alert, it's consumer privacy and the use of consumer data. And then, um, and then I'll, I'll end by uh, showing you an application of artificial intelligence, uh, the application that Anubo has built and deployed and is successfully using for a plethora of clients with, with really, really cool results uh, that will enlighten you a little bit about uh, how you can solve this problem in a way that you have probably never thought about solving because you weren't trained to think about the problem this way. And I think isn't that the cool thing about AI? You can you know, think about things in a different way. So let's begin. Uh, AI. Um, AI, like humans, it's an evolution. Uh, it has gone through a number of stages and ultimately it culminates in the place we're all scared of, which is you know, machines walking around with all self-aware. So let's start there, uh, because that doesn't exist. Um, and it, it, from my perspective and point of view as, as someone who's been around the science for the better part of, well, longer than I want to admit, um, <laughs> it's not going to happen anytime soon. And if it does happen, I actually think it happens much in the same way we humans happened accidentally. Uh, in some way that, that is not known. And, and the reason I believe this is because if you think about it, just as a pragmatist, you, you think uh, uh, to code self-awareness into a machine, you need to have a self-aware human who understands self-awareness because they have to do that to be able to program it. It's just logical. We have no clue how this works in our brain yet and, and no slight against neuroscience. They do a lot of unbelievably fantastic work, but we really don't yet understand how it works. And I'll give you a great example of this that you can take away from a, an article that I read years and years ago that kind of made this clear to me when I read it. They did a study and they got some participants and they put them in an MRI machine. And the purpose was to uh, scan their brains. And they told the people who went in the MRI machine, uh, click a button that's either a left button or a right button whenever you feel moved to do so. Meaning whenever you consciously decide you want to click that button, go ahead and do it anytime you want. Now, what was interesting about this study was, very quickly, the guy in the booth, you know, who was reading the MRI scans, started to notice a pattern, um, a pattern that was predictive of which button they were going to click. Now, that's kind of interesting. Say, so, okay, so the guy knew that they were going to click it when they were going to click it. No, that's not what happened. What happened was the guy in the booth knew seconds before the person in the machine was conscious of the decision they were going to make, which decision they were going to make. So if you think about this for a second, you have lots of questions that could come into your head about consciousness. The very obvious one is, if this guy in the booth knew before the person on the table knew what decision they were going to make, you might ask yourself, who's making our decisions for us to begin with? Um, there was a bit of a free will um, study going on with this, but the point is, Self-awareness still a long way off as far as I'm concerned. So let's deal with things that are real. Um, and the, the three categories that are real in the evolution of artificial intelligence pretty much go uh, a reactive machine to what's called a limited memory machine to theory of mind based machines. It's an easy way to categorize it. There's lots of categorization systems. I kind of like this one because based on my history with the science, it, it has flowed this way. The first one's really interesting and easy to understand, and the majority of the machines out there tend to work this way, and it's exactly what it says, reactive machines. There's something happening right now in real time that a machine is going to react to and make a decision to go do something. They don't have memory most of the time. They don't have a lot of data. They're really just reacting to something occurring. 
a, a great example of this in our modern advertising is contextual advertising. You see cars and Corvette on a page, your client's Chevy, so you say, hey, I, may, I, I make a decision, I'll put the Chevy ad you know, for Corvettes you know, in the spot that's being sold. You're reacting to something happening in real time. Lots and lots and lots of machines you know, that are built uh, around that premise. The second one um, you know, is where the majority of today's technologies sit you know, when you talk about AI. Um, and these ones are, are a little bit more complicated. Um, and they do rely on a lot of data. So you have a lot of information. And effectively, the machines are trying to find a pattern in that data. Um, and there's a number of different analytical and neural network techniques that are used to do that. But ultimately, you're just trying to find a pattern. And, and you ultimately are trying to find a pattern that predicts some outcome that you're looking to try to model. And then you use the outcome to try to reinforce things to you know, train it you know, to get better at whatever outcome you're trying to model. The very best application that, that I know of and the one that everybody in the room will, will know right when I say it um, is from a company that I was a part of um, years back. Um, and it's FICO. We all got a FICO score, right? So we all know how it works. All of our credit history is sitting at the credit bureaus and all of the transactions that we've made is there. It's happening in real time. Whenever we have a new transaction, it's available. The FICO score is looking at that. It's learned what the patterns of behavior are that lead to what? Good FICO, bad FICO, right? Bad FICO, you don't get a loan. Good FICO, hey, you get a lot of money. Um, this thing's been in, in existence for 40 years uh, and probably you know, one of the single best applications of this limited memory-based technology. And I can tell you as an executive that was there building that technology, pay your bills uh, because <laughs> There's no running away from your FICO score after 40 years in. You know, we, we know exactly whether or not you're a good credit risk or not. Uh, but a really good application for it. The last one, and the one where most of the new you know, innovation is occurring, is, is in this you know, theory of mind-based uh, artificial intelligence. And as it sounds, this area of, of AI it, it tries to get inside the way the brain works with the thoughts and the emotions that are part of the human experience. And, and this is very difficult to do, which is why it's sort of the next stage in the evolution and the one that's the precursor to self-awareness. Um, our company was built around using all three of these, by the way, with what we do. And, and by the way, when you encounter AI with the vendors and, and, and other and the technology companies you work with, there's a good chance that we're using various parts of these, these technologies. Uh, but we were uh, created uh, and our vision and mission was built around using this science um, as a complement to the other ones to solve a very specific problem. Um, you know, a problem we knew existed as a result of our backgrounds, you know, around uh, direct-to-consumer marketing, uh, having you know built some pretty successful companies in this space, and the challenge uh, here is that modern advertising has been slowly built over the last you know four decades or so on the back of information, um, and that information was originally created based on people. Um, and in fact, you know, the companies that, that, that started you know, this whole industry you know, originally sat down and said, look, what do we need to do here? And the answer was, we need to collect data. And, and, and they say, hey, what kind of data do we need to collect? And, and, the, and the question was, we need information about people, who? based information. And so the, the question that was originally asked was, you know, who is someone? And when I can figure out who someone is, I can append data to that person. Now, over four decades, having been successful at doing that, those original companies, of course, this way of thinking about advertising has now permeated everything we do in advertising. Your creative strategies, your attribution strategies, your media buying strategies, your data strategies, your prospecting strategies, your journey mapping. Is there really a component of modern day advertising that doesn't have a foundation somewhat in looking at the people behind that? So that, that is the data construct. Um, the challenge with an infrastructure, methodologies and strategies that are built around this kind of information is you're really highly dependent 
on the technologies that are facilitating that. Uh, and then as we have, unless you're living in a, under a rock, you've heard the cookie, you know? Um, what you may not understand is the cookie itself is neither here nor there. It really doesn't, it's, 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 it's nothing. It's meaningless. It's, it's an easy way to talk about the problem, but the real problem is the use of consumer data. And the cookie and the IP address are the means through which you identify people so you can attach data to them. Uh, this is why you see companies with the word identity in their title. I mean, they're telling you effectively what they're supposed to be doing. They're trying to identify individuals so that they can persistently, which means I, I know this person over and over and over again, I can identify them in some way, it's an ID, it's a number, by the way, that sits in the cookie, in case you didn't know that, right? And the IP address is a number that you can make to be an ID that you can attach to a person. They only do that so you can attach data, right? So that you can use that data to make decisions. And, and in advertising, you know, for prospecting, we, we all do that. This is the way it has been done for many, many years. The problem is you're not gonna be able to do that anymore. <laughs> That's going away, and, and Apple's already made it go away, right? In the latest update for iOS, they've obfuscated the IP address now. I've seen they took away cookies, you know, already some time ago, but they've already now defaulted the IP address, so off. Google's, you know, been stalling, you know, the decision to do this. They now say it's gonna be 2023. They may or they may not do it. Um, you know, they're Google, they'll, they'll do whatever they want to do. Um, I submit this, whether or not they do or don't, this pony left the barn. And if they don't do it, the consumer is already doing it. You may not be aware of this, but 70% of us now have a VPN. How many people here have a VPN? Okay. So, you know, how many of us use incognito or private browsing on occasion? The consumer is going to solve this problem whether or not the big companies do or don't. And, and, and so you won't be able to use these mechanisms one way or the other. Um, so this is a real problem, and it impacts so many parts of what we do that you should be very vigilant with whomever you're working with, and, and you can ask some simple questions. Are you using IP address? Are you using the cookie? Are you appending data to anything? And if it is, what is it? Right? Um, and, and I would submit you to start looking at technologies where you don't have to be reliant on those, tech, th those underlying mechanisms uh, because you're just not going to be able to use them anymore. Okay, so let's talk about how you get around this problem, um, which is the, you know, the crux of what you know, we were inspired to do at Anuvo uh, as a result of our backgrounds having been pioneers in the consumer data business, as it turns out. Uh, so you know, we had a pretty good perspective on how to take a run at this thing, and, um, and, and our thought process was the, the only real way to probably solve this is to really reinvent the problem. Um, don't try and do it the same way it's being done now. This is probably a mistake. You know, the, the engineers in us are like, if that's going away, let's not just try to find a different version of that who-based marketing and try to make that work. Why don't we just clean the slate and have a different way of looking at this problem? And, and the question we thought we should answer that was more valuable a question than who is someone was why is someone purchasing the goods and the services and the products that they're purchasing? This seemed like a far more valuable question to ask uh, because it's, that's where the insights come from. You know, the reasons behind the purchasing and the interests in products or brands, not necessarily who they are. And, and we knew because we had created the, the data industry that the data involved in who-based marketing is limited in and of itself. There's a finite set of that information. It's very structured, it's in a database. You got variables and fields. So you're limited to what that is. And so we wanted to you know, unconstrain ourselves from this kind of thinking. And the only way to do that was to use this theory of mind-based uh, artificial intelligence. So let me just set the positioning here for this AI by, by giving you, as best I can tell, the, 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 the best description of how our brains work. Um, and it's a simple description, but it's the best one that I've seen and it's the simplest is usually the best. These things we, we have on our shoulders, they're like giant libraries. 
and the neurons uh, in that brain matter are like the books in that library. And we have this ability as humans to connect all of these various books and information that we've been taught in, um, across our lives. Uh, so that's kind of how it works. And when we have to make a decision, our brains just have the innate ability to connect things together and we don't even realize it's happening, but we're connecting information that we've learned and we say, oh, I know how to answer that question. I'm gonna make this decision. Um, so that was the model. We said, hey, could we replicate this model and create a machine that ultimately could uh, capture the collective wisdom of humanity. I know it sounds like a, a grand you know, statement, but you know, big ideas have grand statements. Uh, and you know, the problem with attacking that problem is it's a big problem. And you have to figure out a way to teach something. And, and the only way and the only source of information that was available that we thought could actually collect the, the collective wisdom of humanity is obviously the internet. The internet has the collective wisdom of humanity captured in it. And, and the idea was, could we use that as a teacher somehow to create an artificial brain with neurons where the neurons were like books in, in the library where we have every single book that, you know, or, or, or piece of information that, that man has ever learned. We call them concepts, by the way. So, you know, they're represented on this slide for a second as books, but they're really concepts in the grand scheme of things. There's a concept for everything. As it turns out, we found out that there was 25 million of them that mattered, um, which is a big number, right? Um, and, 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 the, the, and the trick for trying to solve this problem is, if you wanna do this right and do it mathematically, where our brains do it automatically, you have to actually figure out all of the probabilities between all of these 25 million items. And that means there's trillions of them, just to put that in perspective for you. And it was a really, really hard problem to solve, but, but, but darned it if we didn't actually solve it. Um, so look at the screen, and you see a bunch of books on this screen. So I'll, give, I'll bring this to life for you to show you how the brain kind of works and how this tech works. But if you look at this screen, you see what is uh, apparently a bunch of random books, which it does look like random. Like at the top, you see stuff about pugs, and off to the right, you see some stuff about Norway and Iceland. Down to the right, there's some working out stuff. And off to the left, there's some you know, anxiety stuff. And then up in the far uh, right, I guess you're looking at, I don't know, is like stuff about music and whatnot. Just a bunch of stuff, right? Um, and this is how our brains work, right? There's a bunch of stuff in your head. The way our brains work is we need a context for something. You gotta understand something in the context of something else. This is what the connective tissue does. When you have a context, you suddenly have the ability to, to bring stuff together, right? Um, so let's just take a look at this for a second. And I want you to manage, imagine something, okay? Imagine you're the owner of a product, and that product happens to be a product that looks a lot like uh, you know, the pods we all wear uh, you know, day in and day out. But this one was specific, specifically created to help people sleep better at night. Right, it's called Sleep Pods, and it's a real product from a real brand, right, who was a real client of ours. So the concept here associated with this product, which is the catalyst for trying to understand what's going on, is sleep, right, because that's the nature of the product. Okay, so when you introduce this construct, this context of sleep associated with the product itself, suddenly a technology like this opens you up to all of the reasons why consumers would be purchasing this product. So for example, now you look at the pugs, and you, you still don't understand what that is, but I'm gonna tell you what it is right now, is you look at this product and you start to learn, because our AI can tell us this, that there's a pet angle to this product in the sense that there's dogs specifically short-nosed dogs, pugs and bulldogs, who, as it turns out, have breathing problems because they actually suffer from an illness. It's called Brachycephalic syndrome or something. <laughs> I, I say it like that only because our AI actually told us this, and, and like most of the time with our clients, I see some of this data that comes in the reasons why, and I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. What the heck is this thing? And then you look it up and you say, oh, it's pugs. They got a short palate problem and they snore and snort and 
So what was going on here? The people buying this have those dogs, they're probably in bed with them at night and they're keeping them up at night. And so they're trying to drown them out by, by, put, by buying these sleep pods, all right? Really powerful reason, why? The, the, the right corner is another one. It's like, well, what does Iceland, Norway, and Alaska have to do with my sleep pods? And, you know, I'll tell you what it is, is the sun stays up 20 hours a day. And so the AI is saying, oh, wait a second, that's why these people are buying this product is because they're trying to figure out a way to sleep at night because the sun's up. And it goes on and on and on. This ability to change the way you look at the marketing problem by asking a different question with technology that is smart enough to answer that question can really help us get out from under the confines of the way it works today and not only solve, if you will, the problem of the cookie and the IP address and the use of consumer data, which by the way, if you're a brand marketer or a product marketer with any company that has a lot of consumers, you best be thinking about not using their data in any way because you know, if you can think 10 years out as the privacy issue gets you know, more stringent and more stringent, you'll lose customers if they know you're using their information in, in, in any way. At some point, it seems like that's where we're headed to me. Um, so this kind of technology can free you up. And when you do free yourself up with this capability, uh, it really you know, answers the promise, if you will, of what artificial intelligence is, is really ultimately designed to do. You know? So what is that promise? A machine can act like a human can. This was the Alan Turing test. Right, I think he, you know, the, the is it intimidation game. That was the movie, right? You know, like the father, I guess, of modern computing. He's often cited as the father of modern computing, and that was his test. When a machine can be indistinguishable from a, a human, you've kind of got yourself there. Um, now think about this. Marketing has been been at this problem for years. Like, you know, we've all heard it. How many million times? The right cons person at the right place with the right ad. You know, this, this, how many times have we seen this, right? This is, everybody says they do this. But have we really done that? Did, have we gotten to that? Yeah, we're, we're part way there. But to get the full way there, you really have to understand what's going on in the brain, what's going on with the emotions, with the thoughts. You've got to know why. Why are they behind the screen, right? And that has nothing to do with who. It doesn't have to when you've got technology like ours. When you have this ability to do this, it frees you to be able to do things like for a casino client of ours, right? To be able to tell them, hey, the steakhouse you've got is the draw for your casino. Of course, they're in the casino business, so they want to make money from gaming, right? Hey, but hey, the steakhouse, that's the draw, and the AI is saying that. But wait a second, it's saying more than that. It's saying, you better be thinking about vegan. And so, you're, now you're all going to look at me and go, it's a steakhouse, right? What is the hell is vegan? <laughs> have to do with it, which is what the client says, because that's, our tech does this, and it's usually like that. They're like, what are you talking about? Your stuff's not working, right? And we're like, no, 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 wait a second. You don't understand, right? What the tech's telling you is that people come to your steakhouse in pairs, and there's a good chance one of them's a vegan these days, and they're not coming to your steakhouse, which means they're not going to your gaming. They're going somewhere else that has vegan. What, what does the casino do? They change their menu, and they put vegan items on the menu. And that's exactly what they did when they learned of, of, of this reality as a result of us you know, running the media for them and using this tech. It allows you to take a, um, an unbelievably great product from uh, a company that is revolutionizing another pet-oriented uh, thing, but uh, revolutionizing the pet. So if anybody got dogs in, in the audience, you probably have an electric fence, static, you bought it, it costs a lot of money. It's designed to keep your, you know, your pet within the confines of your home typically, very limiting. This company invented a technology that allows you to unleash yourself and your pet from that confines by having an app where you can draw a geo boundary and anywhere you go, whenever you're on the road. What does the tech do? The tech basically allows us to tell that company, hey, wait a second. The tech's telling us that there's a lot of people who are RV enthusiasts who are showing an interest in this product. Now, by the way, they weren't even thinking about this. This is another thing. I see when you tell somebody the answer to these things, they're like, yeah, well, of course that makes sense. But like I was telling you, that's how your brain works. It's not like that stuff's not in there. You just didn't connect it. 
right? And so when I say it to you, you're like, oh, of course that's the case. They get the pets. They're on the road in the RV, and they want to map a geo boundary because they're traveling a lot, and they don't want to lose the pet, right? Our AI has the ability to tell them that, and better, to target to it, right? So keep in mind, our, our tech targets the whys, not the who. We don't care who you are. We just care, hey, you, you, look, you know, you got some kind of interest. You're behind a screen, and you're interested in RVs. We know this, right? Um, and then, of course, you know, the pug example, right? It allows you to go to that client and say there's an audience here, right? A lot of different audiences, but one of them, you know, is this audience you never would have, you'd have thought about yourself. Um, so I'll, I'll leave you with, 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 with this, all right? I think the, the, the promise of artificial intelligence is its ability to try to mimic as best we can the way the, the brain works. And, and the brain is language dependent. Um, we view the world our lens through the world is through our language. And when you have a technology that understands that language and can link that language together and, and can use it in a real world application like this that solves a really big problem um, and is already producing better results than conventional technology, I think this is something that's, that's worth you know, looking at. And, and a really cool way of applying you know, a theory of mind based uh, artificial intelligence. So uh, thank you. All right.